Or Sam said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That, of course, refers to being under the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And in the divine dinosphere, the only place, of course, where Bible doctrine can be understood. Therefore, before we start our study this morning, we are going to take our normal few moments of silence, which is designed to give every believer priest both the opportunity and the privacy to make all those decisions necessary to ensure residence in that sphere and to allow for a proper study. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again, from your perfect faithfulness, you've recognized our every need and our capacities. And in fulfillment of the plan that you provided for us, you've given us another opportunity to gather together as a local church to study your word. Then, as a result of its application, to develop capacity. Capacity for love, for life, for happiness, for service, capacity for blessing, and of course the capacity to handle the problems and pressures that you know are an immediate future. We ask now that God and the Holy Spirit would provide for each of us self-discipline, genuine humility, concentration, and anything else we might need in order to function properly and to study properly. And we ask now, in Christ's name, amen. All right. <clears throat> We are in true spiritual giving. Our true spiritual giving. All right. Sorry about that. Looking at the wrong spot here. We are in, in uh, spiritual gifts. <clears throat> we were led there by uh, our study in First Peter chapter four, and we're in the process of, of uh, going through these spiritual gifts, and then we'll get back into that piece. <clears throat> First, we saw a definition and a description. Then we saw the three basic ways that the spiritual gifts are addressed. We saw the time and method. The fact. Oh, you guys aren't seeing anything. Thank you. Come to life. There we go. You can see it's starting to come through. It says definition and description in point two. We saw three basic ways that they are addressed. In sub point, I mean in point three, we saw the time and method associated with the spiritual gifts. The fact that we get the spiritual gifts at a point of salvation. And the method, of course, is through the giving by God, the Holy Spirit, directly and from, God, uh, from uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who provided the gifts to mankind. We saw that the basis is need-driven. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this leads us to understand that there are permanent spiritual gifts and temporary spiritual gifts. The temporary spiritual gifts are temporary because the need for those spiritual gifts no longer exists. Uh, the source of the spiritual gifts, as I said, the Lord Jesus Christ, there was a source, the, the ultimate source, and the uh, source directly to mankind was, or to each individual, is God the Holy Spirit. We saw general information concerning the gifts. We saw the number of gifts, and then we divided them into various ways. And then we started into the gifts themselves in a semi-alphabetic order. <laughs> and I say that because it's alphabetic, but we have two of them that are out of place. And so we started first with a permanent aut autonomous. Remember, permanent means that it is going to go throughout the church age. Autonomous means that it's a gift that stands by itself. It doesn't require another gift in order to function uh, uh, fully. And a support gift is a support gift advice, a, a front line gift. So a support gift is something that is supporting the church uh, directly, <clears throat> but is not a front line gift such as a pastor teacher. Excuse me. So I have the permanent autonomous support gift of administrations. Then we saw the temporary autonomous front line gift of apostle. Next we saw the temporary autonomous support gift of distinguishing, slant differentiating, Slant distinguishings of spirit, or discernings of spirits. Does that purple come out back there? Can you guys see it? Jazz it up a little bit just to get the title. Okay, so a permanent autonomous frontline gift of evangelist. Then we went to the permanent non-autonomous support gift of exhortation. In other words, non-autonomous means that it needs to have another gift that's with it. We saw the permanent autonomous support gift of giving a share slant portion. And notice that faith is out of order, and we're going to get that later. In other words, between exhortation and giving should have been faith. Uh, and I realize we skipped that. Then we saw the permanent autonomous support gift of helps. 
and the fact that healings was out of order. So we should have had healings alphabetically before helps. Uh, H-E-A comes before H-E-L. Okay, but anyway, uh, it will come after we get done with the one that we're currently in. And the one we're currently in is the temporary, non-autonomous, and this is a unique gift of kinds of tongues. And of course the reason it's unique is because it wasn't, it is a spiritual gift, but it wasn't for the function of the church per se, it was to warn Israel. And so we saw the title in point 14, sub point A, we saw, excuse me, we saw the terminology used in the Greek to distinguish the temporary, unique, super spiritual gift is gene gloson. And that is in 1 Corinthians 12.10 and 1 Corinthians 12.28. We saw subpoint one. The first word in this phrase is the accusative plural of the anarthrous neuter noun genos. Genos, excuse me, put the accent on the wrong syllable. Genos, which means basically born one, with emphasis on being born from common stock. Hence, so point little a said, hence, we usually have the idea of race, stock, or descendants of a common ancestor. Little b said, then this noun is extended in a general sense to mean a nation or people. Little c said, then it is further extended in a more general sense to mean a class, category, or kind, or category of people. Little d said, then finally it extended to mean a class, kind, or category of anything, uh, which is the way it's used in this phrase. And little e said, of course, in the plural, the idea is kinds. And then <clears throat> subpoint two said the second word in the phrase is the descriptive genitive plural of the anarthrous feminine noun glossa. This noun means basically tongue is the primary organ of speech or articulation, little b, then it's extended to mean language, little c, then it's extended in a church age technical term in the plural and without the article to mean the gift or the function of a spiritual gift of tongues. And then subpoint little three says so literally we have the phrase kinds of tongues which is the full biblical designation of the spiritual gift. Now we get to point B. Point B is where we are. We're in subpoint two under point B. Point B says the basic definition and description of this unique temporary spiritual gift. Subpoint one, one with single parents around it, says the gift of kinds of tongues was designed and provided by God to warn the unbeliever Jew, and that's 1 Corinthians 14, 22, and 23 that Israel was in a state of tremendous apostasy and malfunction and was about to be taken out under the fifth cycle of discipline, which is Leviticus 26, 27 through 33, which tells us the result of this cycle. And they were about to receive this because they had not fulfilled their responsibility as the priest nation. And last week, <clears throat> see if I can get it here. Last week we read Leviticus the New American Standard, we read Leviticus 23, I mean 26, 27 through 33, which said, Yet, if in spite of this you do not obey me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with wrathful hostility against you, and I, even I, will punish you seven times for your sins. Further, you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you shall eat. I will then destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and heap your remains on the remains of your idols, for my soul shall abhor you. I will lay waste your cities as well and will make your sanctuaries desolate and will not smell your soothing aromas. And I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled over it. You, however, I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. So that's the fifth cycle of discipline. Okay? Now we're ready to pick it up with subpoint two. This is two with single parents around it. Remember the last sentence above said they were about to receive this because they had not fulfilled their responsibility as a priest nation. So subpoint two says. The, P, the priest nation of Israel excuse me as God's chosen people comma had three basic areas of responsibility, colon. Subpoint, 
little a. First of all, comma, it had the responsibility of evangelizing its own people, comma. Teaching its own people the truth of the word of God, comma, and guarding and preserving the truth of the word of God throughout all of its generations. So see, as a priest nation, the first part, part was internal. They were responsible, responsible to keep themselves as a priest nation by making sure that they understood the truth of the word of God, making sure that their people got evangelized and that the word itself was guarded. And as we were studying during the week and we're studying the Old Testament, we saw that they were very good, or the scribes were at least, as far as making sure that they copied the truth of the word of God perfectly. Okay? But the idea was, uh, at this point, they were no longer uh, reading you know, or understanding what it was they were trying to guard. Uh, and in fact, they were no longer really guarding it. Uh, that's evidence by the fact that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the, the Messiah, wasn't even recognized by the people who were supposed to understand the best, uh, you know, who the Messiah was. Okay, subpoint little b. Next, comma, on the basis of its, quote, knowledge of doctrine, comma, end quote. So next, on the basis of its knowledge of doctrine, it had the responsibility of divine establishment provision and enforcement related to its own people. So as a priest nation, what you see is first, you have the internal spiritual well-being of the individuals that was necessary to make sure that they understood the truth of the word of God and that they were understood their position as God's people. Then you had the fact that a priest nation is a nation, and therefore it had to have an understanding and teaching of divine establishment. It had to uh, uh, go uh, to the uh, Mosaic law and, of course, the laws in, in Deuteronomy and Leviticus that, uh, that uh, tell you a nation how to function properly the things on which our nation was based, right? The things such as what? What's the, the primary key for a nation to know that a nation has functioned properly? The fact that you have freedom, you have the choice, you have the ability to use your volition, okay? Free will is always the number one driver uh, for proper function in God's environment. And so a nation, if it's going to function properly, is going to make sure that its people have a maximum opportunity to use their volition. And we see that we are starting to go down the cycles of discipline. We are starting to fall apart as a, uh, as a uh, client nation. Okay, we're not a priest nation. We're a client nation. We're starting to, to uh, go down as a client nation. And we can see that because we're losing our freedoms. 
we're starting to lose the, the key fundamentals of, uh, I guess key and fundamentals is the same as redundant, but we're starting to lose the fundamentals of the laws of divine establishment, which are freedom. And people are willing to give it up. People are willing to throw it away. That shows you the, the, uh, how far we have become and how gen degenerate our uh, uh, society is becoming. We have a whole group of, of younger people who do not understand, they have not been properly taught freedom. Their parents have neglected him. And it falls squarely on the back of the parents. They're sending them to school to get brainwashed into socialism and communism and not freedom. What's good for the state is good for the person. No, it's not. You know, it used to be uh, when you talked about helmet laws, for example, I, you know, as a motorcycle rider, uh, that's one of the key things that is a freedom that I, that I uh, uh, look at, right? Uh, it used to be, you know, the worst thing that happened as far as people taking away your freedom was they mandated that you had to wear a helmet, that you had to have seat belts. See, seat belts shouldn't be mandated. You shouldn't get a ticket for not wearing a seat belt. You shouldn't have to wear your seat belt. The downside is when you get in an accident and you get thrown from the car and you get mangled, you're left to die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, that's the consequence of that decision. But in a free society, you can make good decisions and bad decisions. If you don't want to wear a helmet on a, where, you know, riding a motorcycle, then fine. If you have a motorcycle accident and you have brain damage, then uh, if, you, if someone in your family decides to deplete your entire savings by keeping you on life support, that's one thing, okay? But the idea is there's consequences, and you and I shouldn't have to pay for it. But the problem is we've got this whole anti-freedom mentality that says that human life is sacred and we can't possibly let anybody die over anything. And therefore, we have to protect everybody. And in trying to protect everybody, we protect nobody. We're seeing that in this, this uh, whole pandemic, quote unquote, that we're dealing with right now. Put everybody in lockdown, and then what? And then uh, take away all their freedoms because they're in lockdown. And then once you finally let them out because you haven't had uh, herd immunity, uh, guess what? It's going to go up on the rise because the people that should have gotten it the first time around are finally going to get it. Only now it's going to be more virulent. Such, such, such idiocy. Okay, but the laws of divine establishment would keep things like that from happening. The laws of divine establishment are, uh, were put in place so that we have freedom. And the freedom is protected by the authority of the government, not taken away by the government. Which leads to our second amendment, which says that we're supposed to have the freedom to protect ourselves from our own government. Okay, <clears throat> anyway. That being said, <laughs> subpoint B said, next, on the basis of its knowledge of doctrine, remember this is all doctrinal, based on its knowledge of doctrine, it has the responsibility of divine establishment, provision, and enforcement related to its own people. Then subpoint C, remember the point said that there were three things. Subpoint C says, and finally, comma, it, and of course, this is, uh, we're back to uh, the, the priest nation of Israel. It had the responsibility of missionary activity. Comma. In which other nations were evangelized. Comma. taught the truth of the word of God, comma, taught the laws of divine establishment, comma, and taught how a nation should function under God, period.
See, when we totally corrupted and reversed the intent of the separation of church and state, our nation started to suffer and continues to suffer. See, the separation of church and state, which, by the way, is not in the Constitution. You can't find it anywhere. It was written uh, in uh, other papers okay, uh, that people have glommed onto as founding father papers, and then they started making it a doctrine. But the idea is that the separation of church and state was so that the state could not force you into a particular religion or force you to not have a religion. Remember, the individuals that fought for the, the war for independence in our country had come from a country where the king uh, was the leader of the church. And if you and they had fought many wars. Bloody Mary, for example, the reason you have Bloody Mary was that she was Catholic, she was killing all of the Protestants, okay, as the queen of England. Right, and so the idea was you had uh, you had the you know the, the leaders of the country forcing one religion or another, and the people that fought for our country to uh, to uh, win independence from the, from Great Britain <coughs> understood that we were not to have a state mandated religion, but we've reversed that and we've said, oh, we can't have any religion dealing with the state. That's stupid. The laws of divine establishment which set the nation up are based on having an understanding of Christianity. And if you try to take Christianity entirely out of the government, then you're going to get a godless government. And that's exactly where we're going. No respect for volition. We talk about, oh, we got to respect mankind while we're, while we're allowing atrocities to happen. We're, we're, we're putting uh, uh, our... Our, and I'm getting on a, a soapbox here, but we're putting our elderly, okay, in a lockdown situation, but we're letting our prisoners out of prison because we don't want them to get COVID-19. And lo and behold, guess what? They're starting to see where guys that got out of prison are committing crime again, and they have multiple murders that are being associated with individuals that were supposed to be locked down. In the middle of committing a, a, a robbery, they killed somebody. Yeah, whose fault is that? You ought to take the judge, you ought to take the individual that put that person out there, and you ought to execute them. They're as responsible for that murder as that individual was. If they'd been executed the first time, that wouldn't have happened. Or if they had been left in prison. But see, the problem is, we're leaving God, we're leaving the laws of divine establishment, we're leaving the understanding and, and, and of a nation to protect its people. And by, by protect, we don't mean mother, we mean to protect, to give them the right to make choices, give them freedom, the right to own property. We're getting to the point where you can't own property. You don't believe me? Be a small business owner during this COVID. You couldn't do with your property what you wanted to. You didn't own it. The government did. The government told you you can't sell stuff. That's your livelihood. How many businesses aren't reopening because the government mandated that things be closed down illegally? by the way. It's ridiculous. And we have a whole pocket, huge pocket of society that thinks it was the best thing there could have been happen. They want to see that kind of stuff continue. They want the government to take over everything. You, you have people right now who are saying that we've got to get rid of capitalism. We've got to get rid of uh, uh, all of these things that lead to bad things like bad cops. No, you discipline your cops and you get rid of your cop unions. We had a police chief in Mesa that tried to discipline the cops and the cop unions, the cop union didn't want them disciplined and so they ended up doing a no confidence vote and got rid of the police chief in Mesa who was trying to clean the thing up. So the next time there's a cop killing, uh, you know, a cop that kills a private individual in Mesa, who's to blame? Okay, <clears throat> anyway, laws of divine establishment. Subpoint, this is subpoint one, so you go indent, subpoint one with two parents. So we're, far, we're further indented. Subpoint one with two parents. Subpoint one with two parents. So little C said, and finally it had the responsibility of missionary activity in which other nations were evangelized, taught the truth of the word of God, uh, taught the laws of divine establishment, and taught how a nation should function under God. Subpoint one with two parents. Recognizing this,
helps us to understand and properly orient to the laws of divine establishment concepts if you just put L the E concepts that are located in the Mosaic law comma and the fact that all national entities are responsible to fulfill the principles related to God's laws of divine establishment as they were imparted to Israel. So again, remember the key to the laws of divine establishment are freedom and that the believer has the right to use his volition in his life. Okay? I'll look at the countries that do not provide that and where do they rank? Right? Look at the Middle East. Uh, look, at, look at places like Iraq and Iran where there are no laws of divine establishment and there is no freedom. What kind of advancements have they made past the Stone Age on their own? Everything they've gotten, they've stolen or gotten from someone else, right? Um, look at the, you know, look at other countries that had, have a uh, 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 iron thumb on the necks of their people. Okay, subpoint two, two with two parents around it. In other words, part of Israel's missionary responsibility. as the priest nation to God was to teach other nations that they were responsible to create a, quote, law of the land, end quote, for themselves, that was based upon the laws of divine establishment, as they were given to Israel and presented in the Mosaic Law. Subpoint three, three with two parents around it. Now, see, these countries didn't necessarily have to have the theology that Israel had. 
although God, of course, would, wants all mankind to be saved, wants all mankind to function properly in his plan. Uh, so they didn't, but uh, the, the command was not that they, had, they, they were to be evangelized, that's, but that's separate and, and apart from being, uh, be, being uh, uh, given the concept of the laws of divine establishment. See, the laws of divine establishment can function in any country, whether they're, they're uh, Christian or in Jewish or anything else. Okay, the, those laws of divine establishment are for humankind, okay, regardless of their uh, theology, okay. Now, sub point three, three with two parents around it. As far as the Mosaic law is concerned, and this fits in, I was considering uh, cutting this point out, but it fits in well with our, uh, with our uh, study during the week, so I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. As far as the Mosaic law is concerned, it is divided into three basic areas, colon, Subpoint A is A with single parents around it. Codex number one, that C O D E X number one. Codex is just a uh, terminology uh, used to describe a collection of books. <clears throat> Codex number one, which is called quote the commandments, comma end quote. Now, this isn't the, the Old Testament. This isn't the three-part definition of the Old Testament. This is a three-part definition of just the Mosaic Law, okay? So uh, that's why I left it in, is, is because uh, we're studying the three parts of the Old Testament, but this is the three-part division of the Mosaic Law, okay? So they're not to be confused, okay? So Codex number one, which is called, quote, the Commandments, comma, end quote, and includes the Ten Commandments, or the, quote, Magna Carta of Human Freedom, period, end quote. <clears throat> That's an analogy, obviously, relating it to the Magna Carta that was signed uh, in England, okay, that, that gave people rights. But this is the, the, in other words, what this means is it's the ultimate for human freedom. Okay, and I'm going to give you the, what's included in this. Okay, Exodus 20, 1 through 17. Exodus 24, 12. Exodus 31, 18. And Deuteronomy 5. 6 through 21. So it's chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. Okay? Subpoint little b, b with single parents around it. Codex number 2, comma. Which is called, quote, the ordinances, comma, quote. and includes a complete quote, shadow Christology, period, end quote. In other words, this foreshadows the coming of Christ. This foreshadows what, who Christ is and what Christ is going to do. That's why it's called the shadow Christology. It, it uh, foreshadows the coming of the Messiah. And this, for example, is one of the things that drives the stake into the heart of Israel when they go out under the fifth cycle of discipline because this part of the Mosaic Law for sure should have been understood uh, during the time of Christ. And instead, you have the Sadducees and Pharisees are the ones who end up, uh, you know, uh, crucifying him. The ones who end up not only not, not uh, accepting him, but uh, making sure that we have the, uh, the actual historic cross, okay? Uh, <clears throat> verses for this include, so we have Exodus 24, 12, 
through Exodus 31, 18. Exodus 24, 12 through Exodus 31, 18. Subpoint C, C with single parents around it. Codex number three, comma, which is the quote, social code, comma, end quote. And which is called, quote, the judgments, period, end quote. Exodus 21, 1, through Exodus 24, 11. Continue the point. This codex presents the laws of divine establishment. which are designed to provide true freedom for the human race during the course of the angelic conflict. Period. Okay, so, so far we have codex number three, which is the social code, and which is called the judgments, Exodus 21 through Exodus 24, 11. This codex presents the laws of divine establishment, which are designed to provide true freedom for the human race during the course of the angelic conflict. Continue the point. It includes the function of the divine institutions remember divine institutions are things such as marriage okay so it includes the function of the divine institutions comma diet comma Sanitation, comma. When my kids were young and we were reading through that, they chuckled because when you get to that part, there's a, a part that tells you that you're not supposed to uh, 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 go to the bathroom in the middle of your camp. Okay, you're supposed to go off outside of the camp, dig a hole, and go to the bathroom over there because God doesn't want to step in it. <laughs> and they got a chuckle out of that. <laughs> you know, anyway. <clears throat> Sanitation, comma, quarantine. What's the right well, what's the proper function for quarantine? The Bible tells us. Did we follow it? No. Okay, quarantine, comma, soil conservation, comma. Remember we have the idea of crop rotation given to us in the Bible. Okay, that's soil conservation. Tells you how to till the land, how to, where, where to put your crops, how to, how to set your crops up. Okay, giving you, the, giving you an understanding as how to, how to properly handle the uh, great blessings that God gave you called the planet Earth. <laughs> okay, soil conservation, taxation, comma, military service, comma, 
tells you how to properly treat a deserter, tells you how to, how to handle an individual who's in the military service and got married. Uh, he gets a year off so that he can spend time with his wife so he's not out on the battlefield thinking about his wife and allowing others to get killed because he's not paying attention to his job. So it gives you a year to spend with your wife, and then, then if there's fighting going on, then you go to war, okay? Uh, things like that. So you have military service, comma, marriage, divorce, criminal law, including the rules of apprehension, trial, and proper evidence submission, comma, et cetera, period. In other words, that's where we have, for example, I'll let, you, I'll let you write, I'm sorry. <laughs> to include rules of apprehension, trial, and proper evidence submission, comma, et cetera, period. Remember, capital punishment was mandated by God for crimes that are considered capital crimes. Murder, rape, things like that, okay? And the way they handled it was it had to have two witnesses in order for an individual to undergo capital punishment. And uh, they also had strict rules associated with being a witness. If you gave false testimony in a capital crime, and it was discovered that you gave false testimony in a capital crime, you underwent the same punishment that the, under, that the individual would have undergone, whether they were found guilty or not. So for, for example, say you had an individual who was innocent, and you had two people that decided that they were going to uh, try and get this guy to undergo capital crime, uh, capital punishment. And so they come forward and they say, yeah, we saw him do it, right? And the, and the individual is innocent. Well, they perjure themselves. Well, if they're found to have perjured themselves, guess what? They undergo capital punishment. And the individual to, th that they were trying to frame goes free. So the fact that he went free doesn't mean they go free. They undergo the punishment for uh, uh, lying on the stand. If we did that with witnesses, we might have a bit, little bit better of a system, right? <laughs> Where individuals underwent the same kind of punishment. They'd think twice about lying on the stand, but we don't. Anyway, <clears throat> continue the, the one, one last sentence. And codex number three also includes stated punishments for transgression and non-observance. In other words, it not only says do this, do this, do this, it basically says do this, and if you don't, this is what's going to happen to you. Okay? So codex number three also includes stated punishments for transgression and non-observance. Okay. Subpoint three was single parents, so you're going to go out <clears throat> like three indents. So we're in point B. One with single parents was the gift of kinds of tongues was designed and provided by God to warn the unbelieving Jew. Subpoint two, which is where we picked it up today, said the priest nation of Israel as God's chosen people had three basic areas of responsibility. And now we're ready to go to subpoint three. This is subpoint three with single parents around it. So the Jew, comma, as a part of his priest nation responsibility, comma, was supposed to use the, quote, beautiful, comma, smooth, 
comma, flowing sound, of the Hebrew language, end quote, So we have, so the Jew, as a part of his priest nation responsibility, was supposed to use the, quote, beautiful, smooth, flowing sound of the Hebrew language, end quote, to enunciate sure, E-N-U-N-C-I-A-T-E to enunciate and articulate A-R-T-I-C-U-L-A-T-E the quote, magnificent slant great things of God, comma, end quote. And put in parentheses, Acts 2.11 from the Greek, close parent. both to his own people and to the people of other nations, period. Put in quotes the the uh, beautiful, small, uh, smooth, flowing sound of the Hebrew language because, uh, to me, it sounds very guttural. <laughs> it's, it it uh, when spoken, I guess back in the day, it was much much prettier. I guess. Sub point four four with single parents around it. However, at the time. of the beginning of the church age, comma, so we have however, at the time of the beginning of the church age, comma, Israel had degenerated to its lowest point ever, period. Very few Jews were actually believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And almost none were in any way functioning properly, period. They had degenerated to the point where being the Jew was the badge of honor, right? The fact that I'm a Jew and I'm a better Jew than you are because I know more about the law than you do and I know more, but they didn't function in it, okay? It's like, it's like the, uh, you know, the uh, theoretical mathematicians that come up with all this math and stuff and they never use it for anything, right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> Caterino and I had a professor in college one time who was uh, uh, supposed to be teaching us electri electrical or electronic theory, and he was more of a mathematician than he was an electrician, or not electrician, but an electrical engineer, right? And he turned everything into math, but he could never really help you explain what you're supposed to do with it, right? 
and it was hilarious because we were at midterm. We were getting ready to go to a uh, get ready to take the midterm, and uh, the professor said, "Okay, I, you know, today's the day. Where I'm going to give you an opportunity. You can ask any questions you want. You know, ask whatever you want uh, before the midterm. You know, because we're going to have it next week. Blah blah blah. Right? So he's fair. He's giving you the opportunity. And one of the best guys in class, an older gentleman who was also in the Air Force at the time, uh, raised his hand and he said, "Where are we? Where have we been? And where are we going?" <laughs> And the whole class erupted in, in laughter, <laughs> okay, <laughs> because we're, it, it, was, it was impossible to understand what the guy was trying to tell you, okay? Well, that's what these Jews had done. These Jews had lost the concept of being able to evangelize, being able to teach about the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, or in, in their case, the, the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? Being able to, to do any of that stuff to function properly as a priest nation because they were so concerned about how great they were and how much they knew. And that's something we have to be careful of as a church because we study doctrine. We study it very hard. We're going very slow. We're going through all this. It would be very easy for us to say, I know so much more than you do, so I'm not even going to explain it to you. Our job as ambassadors is to make sure that we function properly and we give people the opportunity to, uh, to understand about the Lord Jesus Christ. We can evangelize them in words that they can understand. We don't use the technical terms that we have. We use information. Okay, We can break it down and give it to them. And always remembering that our proper function is as priests and ambassadors. Not just sit here and get information and store it away and say, look, I've got file cabinet after file cabinet of doctrine. I'm so much better than you. Then you're no better than the Jews that, uh, that went out under the fifth cycle of discipline. We're supposed to have this information so that we can understand it and give it back so that we can make sure that other people can understand it. We can use terminology that they understand. Okay? Always remember that. Point five. This is five with single parents around it. Therefore, comma, we see that at the beginning of the church age, on the day of Pentecost, in A.D. 30, I may eventually go to the modern way of uh, giving dates, but right now I'm not. <laughs> A.D. 30, Israel was tactically, quote, defunct, end quote, D-E-F-U-N-C-T, defunct, as a properly functioning priest nation, period. However, in its, quote, apostate form, comma, end quote, God allowed it to run concurrently So God allowed it to run concurrently with the newly formed church, comma, which was that entity designed and provided by God to take over Israel's priest nation responsibilities, period. We'll do one more sub-point because I want to I uh, give you some information here regarding what happened, and, 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 and that was why I also read uh, the, the passage 
about the fifth cycle discipline. So, uh, sub point five said, therefore, we see at the beginning of the church age on the day of Pentecost in AD 30, Israel was tactically defunct as a properly functioning priest nation. However, in its apostate form, God allowed it to run concurrently with the newly formed church, which was designed and provided to take, uh, designed and provided by God to take over Israel's priest nation responsibilities. Sub point little a. And this concurrent existence. would continue until late August or early September of AD 70 when Israel as the defunct priest nation to God would be taken out under the fifth cycle of discipline for the last time before the millennium. Notice the difference in dates, by the way. Uh, it started in AD 30, ended in AD 70. That's 40 years. That's the uh, biblical uh, uh, number for discipline. Right? They wandered 40 years in the desert. Well, they had 40 years of discipline to uh, try and straighten out, and they didn't. They were taken out. And I want to read you this article. This comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica under the, uh, under the uh, uh, First Jewish War. It says, in 63 BC, well, they actually say BCE, in 63 BCE, the Roman general Pompey captured Jerusalem. The Romans ruled through a local client king and largely allowed free religious practice in Judea. At times, the divide between monotheistic and polytheistic religious views caused clashes between the Jews and Gentiles. This friction, combined with oppressive taxation and unwanted imperialism, culminated in 66 CE in the first Jewish revolt. The revolt was successful at first. Jewish forces quickly expelled the Romans from Jerusalem, and a revolutionary government was formed that extended its influence into the surrounding area. In response, the Roman Emperor Nero sent the general Vespasian to meet the Jewish forces, an endeavor that pushed the majority of the rebels into Jerusalem by the time Vespasian was proclaimed emperor in 69. Okay, so they got them all contained into, Jeru into uh, Jerusalem. Okay? In April 70 AD, about the time of Passover, the Roman general Titus besieged Jerusalem. Since that action coincided with Passover, the Romans allowed pilgrims to enter the city, but refused to let them leave. See, so in other words, they said, yeah, you can enter the city, knowing full well that they were going to close it off. So now they've got them all in one place. Thus strategically depleting food and water supplies within Jerusalem. Guess what happened? This book doesn't cover it, but exactly what the Bible said. There was a siege. They started running out of food. What did they start doing? They resulted to cannibalism. They started eating their own kids, exactly like the Bible said. You will eat your, your sons and your daughters, and they did. Within the walls, the zealots, a militant anti-Roman party, struggled with other Jewish factions that had emerged, which weakened the resistance even more. Josephus, a Jew who had commanded rebel forces but then defected to the Roman cause, attempted to negotiate a settlement, but because he was not trusted by the Romans and was despised by the rebels, the talks went nowhere. The Romans encircled the city with a wall to cut off supplies to the city completely and thereby drive the Jews to starvation. It's exactly exactly what the Bible said would happen under the fifth cycle of discipline. By August 70 AD, the Romans had breached the final defenses and massacred much of the remaining population. There was not much left. They also destroyed the second temple. Isn't that what we read? They were going to destroy the altars. They destroyed the second temple. 
The Western Wall, in case you ever wondered what the Wailing Wall is in, in, in Jerusalem, okay, that's the Western Wall of the Temple. Okay? The Western Wall, the only extant trace of the Second Temple, remains a site of prayer and pilgrimage. The loss of the Temple for a second time is still mourned by Jews during the Feast of Tisha Be'ev. Rome celebrated the fall of Jerusalem by erecting the triumphal arch of Titus. That leaves us ready for sort of part B. But I wanted to get to that article today, and the reason I read the, the part <clears throat> was, it was so that you could understand that exactly what was predicted for the first, cycle, the first, the fifth cycle of discipline happened to them. Okay, their area was destroyed. Their temple was torn down. They uh, resorted to have to eat their own young. Okay, all of this as a result of the fifth cycle of discipline. And this will leave us ready for subpoint B next week because we are going to have communion as our second class. Okay. I ran you over a little bit, but we started a couple minutes late because we were ranting. Okay. <clears throat> True spirits are giving. Timetable of concepts given to us in 1 Corinthians 16.2. On the first day of every week, let each one of you, according to his own judgment, be putting aside and saving according to how he might be prospering. Of course, prosperity is the key. Then we have 2 Corinthians 9.7, which gives us the principle and prohibition. It says, each one should give just as he himself has decided, what is the right amount in his heart, slant right lobe, not out from sorrow, pain, distress, reluctance, related to the personal loss of funds, nor out from compulsion, slant pressure. For you see, the God keeps on loving a cheerful, satisfied giver. The only way we can function properly in giving is to be functioning properly in the divine dinosphere, which means you have no mental attitude sins associated with the, what's in this passage. Then we have the dictate and promise. In Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 says, Honor the Lord from your prosperity and from the first of all your income. And if you do, your storehouses shall be filled with superabundance and your vats shall overflow with new wine. Telling us that if we function properly with what we have, we are showing that we are open for more and greater blessing. Then we have doctrine as true wealth given to us in 2 Corinthians 8, 12. It also includes a warning. For you see, if the eagerness, willingness, readiness, that's a positive volition, is present, this is perfectly acceptable to the degree that he might be having. Then it goes on to say it is not perfectly acceptable to the degree that he is not having doesn't mean that you can't function properly if you don't have. It means that if you give uh, <clears throat> your eagerness, willingness, and readiness, and then try to give sacrificially uh, in, the, in the temporal area, then you're destroying that mental attitude. And finally, I have a God's ability to supply prosperity. It says, now the God keeps on being manifestly able to richly provide all grace to you in order that while always having complete self-sufficiency in everything, you all might be providing richly to every divine good work, slant production. We're going to go ahead now and give us some moments of silence in order to uh, uh, give in the... Uh, 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 spiritual area in order for you to be able to function properly and give <clears throat> spiritually. And then we're also going to uh, give you the opportunity, to, if you've been prospered, to give in the temporal area. Uh, and the, if you've been prospering, that is your decision. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to come to you in prayer, to be able to exhale back to you a portion of what we receive from you, our understanding of everything you've provided for us, including the plan uh, that you provided for all mankind to be saved, the fact that you gave your son, as we'll be studying in the second class, as, a as the perfect sacrifice for us in order for us to be able to have the potential for salvation. And then once we've accepted it, you didn't just leave us there. You provided everything necessary for us to be able to grow from being baby believers to all the way to being mature believers. And as a result, being able to experience family fantastic above and, bless, above and beyond blessings in time, as well as being able to understand that we have an escrow waiting for us in heaven, above and beyond blessings in eternity. And for that, we are truly grateful. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're going to go ahead and end with a song. If you'll stand, we're going to sing from the folders. <clears throat> 